Christ's precious church. That's who we are, right? We're meant to assemble together as God's people for the purposes of bringing each other closer to Christ so that he may be glorified through us. We're the body of Christ. We're the family of God. We're united by the Holy Spirit as we speak the truth to one another in love, that we may grow to be more and more like Jesus Christ, that we may mature in Christ. When every member of the body of Christ, working properly, works together, we grow. We build ourselves up in love. We are, in fact, stronger together. Amen to that? Stronger together. That's God's design, that we would be there for each other and help each other grow to maturity in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, one of the keys to that growth is the fact that we are loved. And because of the love that we have received by God, we also ought to be those that love. So we are made to love others as well. Uh, as we will take a moment to look at God's words this morning, won't you just uh, take a moment first to uh, pray to God with me. Lord God, we recognize that you love us so greatly, and we are so thankful. We know that there is nothing that can separate us from your love uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and we thank you, and we give you honor and praise. Father, as we look at your word today, help us to be uh, introspective, to recognize the flaws that we have in our own life, but to depend on you. Father, we want to be more like Jesus Christ. We want to have the same love that you had for us, for one another. And Father, help us to overcome some of our differences, some of our opinions within ourselves. Put that aside and, and let your love shine within us. Father, help us to grow. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As I was in the preliminary stages of prepar preparation for this lesson, I came across an article from uh, Max Lucado about God's love. And I'm going to go ahead and, and read that for you. This is what he wrote. He said, When we look at the world around us, sometimes it's difficult to understand the unfairness of life. It's not fair that young should suffer. It's not fair that the innocent should go hungry. But nor is it fair that God would have to come to earth and hang on his own cross to protect us from the evil one. It's not fair. But that's love. And that's God. God's love for you is not dependent on how you look or how you think or how you act or how perfect you are. His love is absolutely non-negotiable and non-returnable. Ours is a faithful God. No matter what you do, no matter how far you fall, no matter how ugly you become, God has a relentless, undying, unfathomable, unquenchable love from which you cannot be separated, ever. So, run to Jesus. Jesus wants you to go to him. He wants to become the most important person in your life, the greatest love that you'll ever know. He wants you to love him so much that there, there's no room in your heart or in your life for sin. Invite him to take up residence in your heart. In our 21st century Western culture, if we were to use the words, love of my life, we might think of that some sort of uh, dream, some sort of impossible dream of finding that perfect person that fills our life with meaning and joy. But isn't Jesus in my life and Jesus in your life that pers perfect person that can fill us with joy? Did Jesus himself not say that if we abide in his love, then we will be filled up with his joy? Can we not let the words, Jesus is the love of my life, Jesus is the love of my life, fill us? Bring us to that realization that, yeah, our souls light up because Jesus is in our hearts. But what does it mean for Jesus to be the love of my life? What does it mean for Jesus to be the love of your life, to be the love of this church? Is Christ Jesus truly the love of our church? Is he the, the, the one thing that fills us so much that nothing else compares? We're in the book of Ephesians last time, and I intend to finish in Ephesians again today. Uh, when this letter was written, uh, there didn't seem to be any particular problems within the church at Ephesus. Uh, 
Paul spends some time talking about all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus for the first half of the book. And then he goes on to talk about the practical application of living out a life worthy of this calling that we have in Christ Jesus in the second half. How this is about relationships with one another because of what God has done for us. Paul prays that the church would come to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. At first glance, we might think, well, how is that possible to know something that's beyond knowing? Well, it's because we have faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not only that we have faith in Jesus Christ, but it's the we part. That we come to know this love that surpasses knowledge because there's this relationship that we have with one another as the family of God. And so we come to know something that's beyond knowledge because Christ Jesus is alive in every one of us. Obviously, that, the picture up there, by the way, is... Uh, is it stretched? Oh, I thought I'd try to fix that so it wouldn't be stretched. The picture up there is when my dad and I, a few years back, were in, uh, over there on the other side of the world. That's Ephesus. That's looking back at the theater there. So the church at uh, Ephesus is not there anymore, is it? There's no church in the town of Ephesus anymore. This is a thriving church. Seemed to be very diligent about following, uh, loving Jesus Christ. At this point, when I mean, this letter is written, there seems to be no particular problems that they have. He's just instructing them in the way to live out a Christian life. But then, a little bit later on, closer to the time, not now, but a little bit later on, maybe a, a generation or so, 20, 25 years later, this same church is written to in the book of Revelation, in, in John's writings. This church that seemed to be on a, on a good track seems that there's a concern with that church. And this concern is this, that they've lost their first love. As a church, they were holding fast to the truth. They were working with patient endurance. They were upholding the name of Jesus Christ. But he tells them to repent for lack of love. Could it be that instead of our love for Jesus growing, that in time it actually could diminish? We may be holding to the truth. We may be uh, firm in our belief. We may be enduring whatever we may be enduring for the sake of Christ's name. But what if love is missing? Is it possible that that could happen? A few weeks ago, uh, they're not here today. I was going to pick on them, but they're not here. Carl and Lucy were, uh, were married. They were wed. Uh, before they get, got married, of course, uh, when I marry someone at we go through some counseling sessions. And one of the things I do with all those that are Christians that I counsel before they get married is that uh, I tell them, okay, so listen, you need to love Jesus more than you love Kyle, if I'm talking to Lucy. You, lead, you need to love Jesus more than your spouse. And if you truly love Jesus, then what will absolutely happen if you truly love Jesus is you will love the spouse with whom God has blessed you. That's what's going to happen. But if you try to do it the other way on, there's where you're going to have some troubles. See, Jesus has to be first. He has to be the love of our life. Often people will talk about the honeymoon period. Uh, of course, you, you know, sir, I, I guess no one's going away for honeymoons anymore. They went all the way to Montreal, I understand. Woo, big, big Montreal trip for honeymoon. But when we talk about the honeymoon period, oftentimes we're not just talking about that week or two when the people go away. We're talking about that, that newness, that, uh, that lasts for some time, some excitement that's there. And then all of a sudden, one day, it, it dawns on you that that person, that perfect person that you married, isn't quite as perfect as you thought. Huh, go figure. We all have our weaknesses. You find out that loving him or her actually requires real commitment. It requires work. It requires humility. It requires submissiveness. It requires sacrifice. It requires, well, you get the picture. It, it, there's a lot required here. Even when we have feelings for one another, feelings do not endure the various challenges of growing up in a relationship. There are things that are going to come along. Sure, there's good times, but there's also going to be difficult times. There may be health struggles. There may be financial burdens. Not to mention everyday uh, personality quirks, things that bug us, differences of opinion, human error. Did Christ's love for you and I come easy for him? Did, he not did it not require him to surrender, to sacrifice, to suffer? 
In John 15, when Jesus talks about himself as the true vine and his disciples, that's us being the branches, we're told what it means to have a life that is fruitful. He tells us that, well, the, the way to have a fruitful life, if you're a branch, is you have to abide in the vine. And who is the vine? Well, Jesus Christ. You have to abide in Jesus Christ. And Jesus narrows in on or zeroes in on what it is to abide in him. A couple of things that he mentions specifically is, well, you need to abide in my words. And you also need to abide in my love. That's how you're going to abide in Jesus Christ. You have to understand the things that he says, but you also have to understand who he is. He is love. And we need to have that same love. He goes on to give his disciples a commandment. He's, Jesus said this. He says, love one another as I have loved you. That's how we're supposed to love one another. He says, greater love hath no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. Uh, you mentioned about him being our friend today, didn't you? And our brother, and most of all, our Savior. But the reality is that Jesus Christ, he loves us so much, and it's not that he will never, that he will stop loving us, he continues to love us, but what he desires for us to have is a meaningful life, a life full of joy, and that happens if we follow this command. But not only is it about him loving us when we were when, he's friend, when we're friends with him, it also says that he gave up his life. He died even when we were enemies of God. When asked who my neighbor is that I'm supposed to love, remember Jesus getting asked that question? So, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Have you ever wondered why it's called the Good Samaritan? You know the word good's never found in that parable? but it says it's the Good Samaritan. So why do we call it the Good Samaritan? Maybe it's entitled the Good Samaritan because we know that practicing love is good. We know that practicing love to an enemy is to be like God. And God is good. And God is love. But even as Christ's precious church, the ability to love doesn't just come naturally to us. It's not easy. Sometimes it seems that some are better than others. But for every one of us, it requires work. It requires effort. It may even require sacrifice. What's common for most of us is this tendency to look out for ourselves first. To think of me before you. The natural tendency is to focus on what's good for me instead of what's, on, what's good for you or what's good for the church or what brings glory and honor to God first. Now, I'm not saying that we don't think about Christ first. I'm not saying that we don't think about our brothers and sisters in Christ and what's good for them. But inside of every one of us is this default. And the default's name is me. And that's something that we can't get away from. And so it requires effort. It requires work. You probably knew I was going here because it's probably in the banner and I think it might have been put up on the board ahead of time. But what's the one chapter in the Bible that talks about love? The whole chapter? Anybody? Yeah, you knew it. There are actually a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about love and it's like, well, if I'm going to talk about love, where should I go? Well, I guess I'll go to the one everybody knows is the love chapter. Uh, I thought about putting in life groups uh, one of the questions of uh, find as many passages as you can to talk about love, and I thought, well, that'll take them more than one week, so maybe I shouldn't do that. But we're going to go ahead and look at this chapter, and I want us to, as we do that, before we do that, just consider the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There were many difficulties in the church at Corinth. But one of the primary problems that seemed to be facing the church was one of division. And at the root of division within the church is this whole me thing. That monster me inside of every one of us that says I'm more important. And the, in the immediate context, he's talking about spiritual gifts. Even those people that were received, had received spiritual gifts, special gifts through the Holy Spirit were thinking that somehow their gift was better than the other guy's gift. 
And so within this context of even, even doing things that are supposedly like the good things and, and helpful things, there's this problem that me is creeping up. And so he inserts this, what's most important, what's the most excellent way in chapter 13. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So are faith and hope important? Of course. We cannot live without hope. And our hope is directly tied, it relies on our faith that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Without these, we would be doomed. So if faith and hope are so vital to our life, and yet love is greater, how much greater is it? See, love is, in fact, the greatest. It's greater than faith. It's greater than knowledge. It's greater than hope. It's greater than the spiritual gifts. It's greater than, well, whatever. You can fill in the blank there. I just left a blank for you. Because if there's something that you think is so wonderful and great in the world, well, whatever that is, put that in that slot. See, love is way greater. It's the greatest. Is it possible that we could have so great a faith as to remove mountains and not have love? See, Paul says without that love, your faith is nothing. It's nothing. We might think it incredible that a person would sacrificially give all that they have to serve the Lord. But if love is missing from the equation, nothing's gained. Some pride themselves in all the knowledge that they've attained. But knowing about God is nothing without love in our hearts. It's not that we shouldn't seek after things to know. It's not that we shouldn't want to grow in our faith. Absolutely. All these things are wonderful, but love has to be... If love is missing... It's all for nothing. There's so much packed into Paul's definition of love here in verses 4 through 7, and we're just going to touch the surface this morning. I hope that you will join a life group or you'll have a, discussion, a family discussion about this in more detail. He starts out with the idea that love is patient and kind. Of course, last time we talked about bearing with one another in love. That's patience. It's that bearing with each other's weaknesses. It's enduring through the struggles alongside one another in kindness, looking for ways to offer a word of kindness, a helping hand. Love does not envy or boast. After all, love is not self-centered. We rejoice with the good fortune of our brothers and sisters. We don't wish that we didn't, they didn't have it, and we did. We don't envy. Instead, we bless those that we, we, we are thankful for the blessings that we have. We don't boast about our blessings, but we give honor and praise and honor. Honor and praise and honor. Honor and praise and honor, sure, to God. Love is not arrogant or rude. That's absolutely the opposite of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Who humbled himself. 
Love doesn't insist on its own way. Although, you know, I actually have really good ideas and my ways are better. But isn't that the way, isn't that not, if we have a really good idea, of course we think our way, but it doesn't say, no, wait, I have such a great idea, I don't care what your idea is. It doesn't insist on its own way, it doesn't force its, its perspective. It doesn't take the hostage, take hostage the whole congregation until I get it my way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Uh, here's where I've got to be careful myself, in my own family at least. I know my daughter, I sometimes irritate her, and I actually do know some things that irritate her. Sometimes what happens though is, you know, I'm irritating, and I don't realize it at first, but then I'm made aware of it, and then do I stop? I'm getting a good reaction though, right? See, we have to be careful. These things, they, they creep into our lives in all sorts of ways. For me, that's one of those areas that it creeps in, and I have to be careful. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Not only does it not rejoice with wrongdoing, it actually abhors what is evil. That's what we're told in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, that that's the way we ought to consider that. Things that are not of God, things that are unrighteous, there's no way we would rejoice at those things, but we do rejoice at the truth. In fact, as people of the truth, that's our life, is to rejoice in the things of God, the righteousness of Him. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It never ends. There's so much there, isn't there? And I'll let you talk about that in your groups. It's because of God's love poured out on us through Jesus Christ that we are saved. It's God's love that enriches our souls, that enables us through the life-giving spirit to practice righteousness, to practice love to be a part of the positive growth of the Lord's church as each one of us uses our gifts to build up the body of Christ. What is that indispensable ingredient needed for grow the growth of Christ's church? What is the greatest gift that each one of us can give, that we can work on, that we can cultivate within ourselves that will help the church grow? Well, we, all, we all have various gifts, and they're not all the same, but one thing that we can all work on, that we can all cultivate within ourselves, is a four-letter word that starts with L. Right? Love. I do encourage you to talk about this more in your groups and your family settings to delve more deeply into this topic of love and what it means for you. Talk practically about deepening your love factor for the church in this place. But I'm going to leave you with a homework exercise because everybody loves homework. And uh, all those that are going to school in the next little while, they're so happy that they're going to go to school, although there's a little bit of timidity there maybe. It's a little bit scary. Pray for our people that are going back to school. But here's the homework I want to give you. It's a simple thing. I do this with, uh, when I'm doing premarital counseling, I have the, the couple do this. They look at this, this passage again, reread 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Now, if you're here, uh, I expect you to do the work. So, you know, if you're going to remember this, great. If not, you can go ahead and take out your phone and take a picture of the screen right now because you're going to do the work, right? Amen? Uh, wait a minute, let's try that again. Yeah, I want to do this work. I want to grow in love. I'm going to do the work, Kevin. Amen? Amen. A little better. Oh, that, there we go. A few people got out their phones just to show that they're listening. Good job. So you reread the passage. Make a list. There's, there's uh, many characteristics of what love is and what it is not. But understand, make out a list and think about the things that are your strengths. Maybe you're not an envious person at all, so uh, that's a strength. I'm not envious, that's good, that's on my, on my strength side. Maybe a little bit of the time, but mostly I'm, I'm not, so that's good. Maybe you're not at all patient, so okay, well, that's a, that's a weakness side. So, so make up a list of your strengths and your weaknesses, your personal ones. Then I want you, what I want you to do is for your partner or for, for a brother and sister, and you're going to do this with a pair, okay, is you're going to honestly... Consider what the other person is like. So, uh, yeah, they're not very patient at all, actually. So I'm sorry, I had to put that on the weakness side. And uh, irritable. Oh yeah, <laughs> Kevin. Yeah, that, I better put that on the weakness side. And I want you to make that that list. And then, 
you know, you're doing this on your own, each one of you, but then you're going to share with each other. Because what happens often is if we have an honest perspective of somebody that loves us, that cares about us, then we, it starts to open up our eyes to some of maybe the, maybe there's some flaws that I need to really work on. Or maybe there's some things that I'm actually, you know, that are pretty, that, I'm, that I do well and, and, I, and that should be emphasized. I, I need to recognize that. Whatever the case, use this as an opportunity to grow in your love to cultivate a greater love for others and for the church in this place. And as we consider this idea of loving each other, like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that's what it tells husbands to do in Ephesians 5, right? But it's not just for husbands, it's for everybody to love each other, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. As we do that, the church in this place will grow. We'll each be doing our part, but what will be at the center of everything is this idea of love, that we want to grow in love. I don't know about you, but I don't really think I'd like the idea of being the church at Ephesus. It's a really nice archaeological site right now, where, they, where the, the city where Ephesus was. But there's no church. The love is gone. For a while there, they were very strong in the church. And I don't know what happened later on. I think actually, you know, in history, it seems that they still, they, they did overcome. They did get back their first love. But somewhere along the way, it got lost again. Churches don't, in certain places, don't always stay forever, that's for sure. But in our generation, with who we are right now, do we not want to thrive as the Lord's church in this place? Amen to that? And thriving as the Lord's church in this place has, starts with, at the heart of it all, is to know the love of Christ that surpasses understanding. And so I would like to, as I finish up, like to go ahead and pray on behalf for my prayer for you as the church, and I hope that you will make this your prayer for each other and continually pray this often for the church in this place. It's the same prayer that Paul makes in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And as I finish the prayer, you go ahead and say amen at the end. Paul said this, For this reason I bow on my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And the congregation said,